India is a huge country, but if you look at it through a social development lens, many of its states appear worlds apart. Some have social outcomes on a par with sub-Saharan nations, while others have outcomes comparable to those of Northern Europe. How to explain such differences within a single country and among states that started at a similar point in history? And what does that mean for societies beyond India? From Brown University's Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs, this is Trending Globally. I'm Sarah Baldwin. We're joined today by Prerna Singh, Mahatma Gandhi Assistant Professor of Political Science at the Watson Institute and an expert on the politics of social welfare. In her award-winning book, How Solidarity Works for Welfare, Subnationalism and Social Development in India, she analyzes the very different evolutions of social policy and welfare systems across states in India. Welcome to the podcast, Prerna. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks for being here. First of all, I, I learned that your book recently became came out in paperback. That's right. It's quite exciting. Yeah, it means it's great. affordable. Yeah, that's fantastic news. So let's start with the most basic concept. Talk to us about solidarity. What is it, um, and, and how does it connect to social welfare provision? Great. Thank you. So as you said, um, the book is called How Solidarity Works for Welfare. And it's in many ways a new and quite provocative argument um, for how social welfare regimes get institutionalized and then continue. And when I talk about solidarity, I mean something not quite not dissimilar to what you have in mind when you think of a kind of sense of solidarity, um, except I show how it's a strength of solidarity with the political community. Um, so you can have a sense, I, th I think of it sometimes as a sense of oneness, mm -hmm. a sense of weeness, um, a sense of identification, uh, a sense of emotional attachment, allegiance, loyalty to a particular political community. And so this solidarity exists between individuals in a family. It can exist um, at a neighborhood level. It can definitely exist at levels of cities. So I think of, you know, um, things like the I Heart New York City t-shirts as mm -hmm. a kind of indication of a certain degree of a solidarity at a city level. And, of course, we have solidarity with the nation, um, which we might think of as nationalism or patriotism. Mm -hmm. But in the book, um, what I delineate is solidarity at the regional or at the provincial level in India. And so I call that subnationalism. And so it's a it's a type of nationalism, it's a type of solidarity at the subnational level. And I argue that this sense of attachment um, and identification with the subnational level is a critical determinant of social welfare policies um, across Indian states. So I explain how that connects. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in a sense, um, most of the existing scholarship tries to explain differences in social welfare by thinking, for instance, most prominently in terms of economic development. Mm -hmm. So you might think that differences in levels of social development are determined by how wealthy a particular region or a state or even a country is, mm -hmm. and therefore how much money they have to allocate to things like education or health or drinking water. Um, there are others that have said that this has to do with the strength of social democratic parties, the general idea being that communist parties um, do a be better job or parties um, that have kind of a strong um, left-leaning mm -hmm. component mm -hmm. to them. There are also arguments about the degree of political competition, and so solidarity is a very different type of argument. Um, the way that I think about it fundamentally is that if you feel a sense of identification with your region, with your state, then that makes it more likely that you are going to support an idea of collective welfare. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, education and health are fundamentally redistributive. Um, the rich across the world will often have the luxury of sending their children to private schools. Mm -hmm. um, the people who send their children to government schools, government health centers, are often those who cannot afford any other type of service delivery. And so under what circumstances are political elites willing to put 
precious state resources into things that are more likely to benefit the poorer, um, the less well-off, the less fortunate members of a community. And it's in those areas that these elites feel connected to or feel some sense of solidarity? You know, so what I show in the book is when there is this sense, and in India it's, uh, it's linguistic, so because states in India are are defined since the 1950s in terms of a, of a common language. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, one of the states that I study is the state of Kerala, which is in southern peninsula, India. And I show that when you feel a sense of Malayali identity, you feel a set of mutual obligations, ethical obligations and commitments to all Malayalis. So you want to put your money into those kinds of services that are of benefit to all Malayalis. And so historically, um, I show mostly through archival work um, that social policies get put into place as a result of these solidaristic identifications. How do you measure that? The bulk of the book is a comparative historical analysis of five states, two neighboring southern states and three neighboring north-central Indian states, Mm -hmm. um, Kerala and Tamil Nadu in the south and Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh and Bihar um, in the north. And in the qualitative historical part of it, and so one of the things, for instance, that I look at is are the boundaries of a state the result of administrative diktat, essentially, Mm -hmm. or are they because the people of the state came together to demand the creation of a state. Kerala, again, is a good example. So is Tamil Nadu because there were huge popular movements for the creation of these states. Under colonial rule, in the 1950s, there emerged these movements, which were language-based movements, saying, you know, people who speak Malayalam are right now divided between the princely state of Travancore, the princely state of Cochin, um, between Malabar, oh, but I really, see. we're all one. Mm-hmm. And so we need one state. And you see something very similar in Tamil Nadu, which is actually, so the name is quite important and interesting. Kerala is a name um, that really refers to a kind of mythical homeland of Malayalis. There was no state of Kerala. Um, until the Mm mid-1950s. Similarly, Tamil Nadu means the home of the people who speak Tamil. Tamil. Mm -hmm. So it's quite interesting that even in the naming of these states, and certainly in the history of how they came to be, you can see that they were a result um, of movements uh, that were premised on this kind of Mm -hmm. subnational pride and attachment. There's a kind of interesting anecdote about the state of Uttar Pradesh. Uttar Pradesh just means the northern provinces. And this was the one state that had a very hard time coming up with a name for itself. Because the sense of identity was less. Exactly, was, uh-huh. exactly. So they couldn't come up with a name. Sort of generic. Very generic. In fact, it just, you know, it, it was basically decided for them. Uh-huh. So, um, so you know, in a sense, it really thought of itself as India. And so when it came up with names, it came up with names that really referred to all of India. And they often think of this kind of association with the level of the nation as something to be proud of. But what they haven't realized is the downside of that, which is no subnational identity. Right. Uh-huh. You, you know, eventually you just get called UP as a kind of geographic appellation. And because they used to be called the United Provinces, so they were referred to colloquially as UP. So Nehru was like, let's just call them UP. That's so interesting. And I'm going to guess that the outcome, social welfare outcomes are less good. Yes. I mean, to give you a sense, even today, if you happen to be a woman born in the countryside in UP, um, you can on average uh, expect to live about 15 years less. Oh my gosh. And literacy probably. Literacy, very similar. I mean, you know, UP, huge state, larger than Brazil, larger than Russia. And, you know, so when you kind of think of national indicators in UP, um, I mean, in a way, India's poor levels of social welfare are to a large extent a result of what's happening in two or three very populous but very underdeveloped provinces so, well, so of which UP is, is certainly one. So to get back to your question of yeah. how I measure it, um, the case studies are very rich historically. So I talk a lot about, you know, how does a state get named? How does a state get created? Um, how many people speak a common language in the state. So what's quite interesting about southern India is that the only state in India where anyone speaks Malayalam is Kerala. So they all speak Malayalam and they're distinguished from their neighbors who speak Tamil. Mm. But if you look at north central India, it's basically, it gets called the Hindi Hindu heartland because there is no distinguishing, there's no linguistic uh, distinction. There are many, many dialects and in many ways those dialects 
are languages in themselves, but they all speak Hindi. And so, so you know, in a way, they speak different types of Hindi, which are these dialects. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, they speak a language that does not distinguish them from any of their neighboring states. And so it's both the lack of a common language and also the lack of a distinctive language. And mm -hmm. then UP has always had this very serious religious divide, not always, but um, I, I actually show in the state how um, in the in the historical part of the book, mm -hmm. I show how this divide really um, gets created um, towards the middle and the end of the 19th century. But the Hindu-Muslim divide becomes quite critical to UP, and then Hindi becomes the language of the Hindus, and Urdu, which is essentially the same spoken tongue, becomes distinguished as the language of the Muslims. So then you get the politics of Hindi and Urdu, so that factors into how I think of subnationalism. And in the statistical part of the book, which is towards the end, I have an index of subnationalism that I create, which is a product of four components language, whether or not your state boundaries are a creation of a popular movement, mm -hmm. whether or not you have a subnationalist political party. And finally, whether or not you have a secessionist movement. So in 2001, the state of UP was divided and a new state was created, uh, which was essentially the divide that had always existed between the hills and the plains. Uh -huh. Well, so if you do have a history of some secessionist movement, then the level of subnationalism is lower exactly. and social welfare is also Absolutely. Low. Okay. So it's I mean my divisive. Exactly. So my brother in law, who technically comes from what used to be the undivided UP, but his family really is from Ut is Uttarakhand, which is the hill parts mm -hmm. of it. Welfare. And Uttarakhand, which is the secessionist state from UP, after its in a way secession from UP has done really well. Uh -huh. Because they have this kind of sense of a kind of, you know, egalitarian hill people, very different from the kind of, you know, so crude planes, you know, I mean, that's mm -hmm. a kind of, sure. but, you know, stereotypes are very important parts of this. Absolutely. Um, and the construction of the other. I've heard you talk about this sense of we-ness, this we, but as you just pointed out, when there's an us, there's a them. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, huh. and as as a North Indian doing field work in, in these southern states, that was very obvious. I was the them. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was a Hindi speaker. Mm -hmm. I was in their eyes, you know, a relatively lighter skinned mm -hmm. Aryan, which is again a construction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and uh, and I was certainly, you know, I was from Delhi. Delhi, the center has always been the them. Is there um, something comparable in the United States? Some sense of... Us I and mean, themness. I used to find it quite interesting when I initially came to the U.S., this idea of license plates. And every state has a license plate. Yep. Because, again, when I think of how subnationalism, what are visible signs of subnationalism, I often think from my research in India, things like, you know, whose statues do you put up? What do you name your streets? What festivals do you celebrate? Um, what stamps do you issue? Um, mm -hmm. So India, we don't have this concept of, of license plates that, you know, you just get one. And so this idea that you can choose your license plate or that there's something written on your license plate doesn't exist. Yeah. There are other things. So in the U.S., I find it quite interesting because in a way, it's a kind of pithy statement, right, of what your state stands for. So like, you know, New Hampshire in the middle of New England, live free or die. Right, and you right? do sort of rally around that You in do. A way. Or even mm -hmm. like, you know, think of some place like Quebec in mm -hmm. Canada sure, where the license yeah. plate says we, you know, yeah. we will not huh. forget. We are different and, and this is this, this this kind of constructed memory, you see it every day. Mm -hmm. We are the constructors of our own identity, right? So American nationalism can mean what, in a sense, Donald Trump imbues it with, but mm -hmm. it can also mean, which it, which it has historically meant at different points in time, you know, the Statue of Liberty, the fact that America is a country of immigrants, that all are welcome, mm -hmm. that this is a certain kind of work ethic, that mm -hmm. there's an American dream. I mean, all of those are contested and constructed. So the fact that, you know, Confederate soldier statues are yes. removed in the city of New Orleans is very much this, con this idea of a construction of an identity. Mm -hmm. um, this is a solidaristic move um, because it's basically showing that these statues do not represent who we are as a community mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is, I think, a very brave decision. So I think in the U.S. you can see it today. There's this controversy over whether for the first time in the history of the United States a national monument could lose its status. So for most people think that don't think of it as headline news. But for me, you know, in the same week, the city of New Orleans says, you know, we will remove these statues because this is not who we are. This, yeah, right? These constructs are not immutable. They are not immutable. And, you know, 
know, I always think when statues move, that's major seismic changes, mm -hmm. you know? Well, it seems like there's an upside and a downside, but taking for a moment the upside of this sense of subnationalism and solidarity, is, th is that something that can be created? I think it's always created. I definitely... I mean, but mindfully, like in yes. with the intention of improving social outcomes, let's say. So I think that that would be an implication for the book. Um, you know, what I show historically is in, in the states that I study in India, that it is very much constructed. They don't have social welfare at all in mind when they're constructing it. Mm -hmm. Subnationalism emerges because it's a tool to basically win a political contest with an established elite. Mm -hmm. So in the state of Kerala, the established elite are this small section of Tamil Brahmins in the mid-19th century. And the word Malayali really becomes repurposed um, in a way to define um, the native population, um, the indigenous uh, people of the state, uh, in a way to both unify them, but then also to distinguish them from this them, the Tamil Brahmins. So it is constructed, but it's constructed because of a set of very instrumental, selfish, mm. you might say, mm. reasons on the part of a certain set of elites. I think what you're asking me is that, you know, in a sense... You know, what is a kind of, in a way, lesson from the research, yeah, yeah, right? For and policy. Exactly. And I think, yes, I mean, when we think of improving social welfare, we do not think of things like, you know, what statues do we put up? Um, what do we name our streets? What national holidays do we celebrate? Um, what songs do children sing in schools? Mm -hmm. um, we usually think of other factors like levels of economic development, political competition, you know. Um, and so, yes, I would say that there is certainly a way in which identity would, hap would have to be at the unit of analysis which controls social policy. So if social policy is controlled at the city level, or, you know, then I would imagine that the, the unit that you want to build solidarity with is the city. It's almost an argument against social welfare policies at, at federal level. It can be. What I say in the conclusion to the book is that, you know, the debates about decentralization are all about the pros and cons of decentralization. They don't really pay attention to what unit is being decentralized to. Uh -huh. So one lesson is, um, you know, decentralize power to a unit that is actually a locus of strong popular identification. Like, I can imagine that something like what the city of New Orleans is doing, this construction of an identity, um, can have implications for many things that happen at a city level. So whether that's trash pickup or sewage cleaning or, you know, in this state, obviously, of New Orleans, like, you know, natural disaster preparedness, mm -hmm. um, you know, because in a sense, it's about kind of, you know, how do you kind of bring people together? Yes. Um, and, and overcome a kind of collective action problem mm -hmm. because we all have different identities, right? So yeah. I'm a woman, I could be, you know, I'm a particular religion. I can identify with various, you know, various different mm -hmm. types of identities. So, and I'm not making an argument that in order to have to be a subnationalist or to be a nationalist or to be a kind of New Yorker and have that identity be central, you stop being all these other things. You remain all these other identities, mm -hmm. but this idea is that you also have a kind of larger overall arching identity that in a way sits above um, all these other identities. And and I think that identity has always been and can be constructed. One of the things I talk about in the conclusion is that we think about policy in the arts and policy in culture as very different and distinct from social policy. But in a sense, you know, oh, the, so kinds of, yeah. the kinds of, you know, so Kerala spent a lot of money initially, invested a lot of money, I should say, um, in the celebration of a festival. Um, and the, it, there's a celebration of a festival, which is quite unusual because when you think about it, most of the festivals we celebrate, um, and I think that's why Thanksgiving is unusual in the U.S., are usually religious festivals. Mm -hmm. But um, Kerala has this national festival called Onam, and Kerala is a very religiously diverse state. It has a lot of Hindus, lots of Muslims, lots of Christians, and yet they're all bound together in this Malayali identity that is celebrated um, so on Onam. And so the state kind of funds these lavish celebrations of the festival of Onam. That brings them together. You know, how is this different from identity politics? I mean, in a sense, it is all identity yeah. politics, right? Um, to me, it's this idea that both in kind of popular parlance, but also um, in, s in academia, in scholarship, in social science scholarship, identity gets to be seen as this bad word. 
And so I tried to make the argument, demographics is not destiny. Right? So even if you're a plural society, it doesn't mean that you can't have a sense of solidarity mm -hmm. that is overarching and that includes members of the political community that also subscribe to different s allegiances, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. What I tried to show in the, in the book is that, uh, is that, you know, you can have this overarching identity above other identities and that can be um, a force, a constructive potential. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's not the case that identity politics is always destructive. Mm -hmm. um, it's really a question so of how it gets constructed and how it you know, how it can and be... And for what? And for what, exactly. Mm -hmm. So what I show historically is that the construction of it historically has come independent right. of the social welfare. The social welfare follows from it, um, but it was not constructed at all instrumentally in mind by saying, oh, let's do this because let's it's going to... Let's do this altruistic. Yes. No, not at all. It's there a was, product of it. Yeah, it was a product of it, but it was not intended in the it's construction so, yeah. of the identity. And I think the lesson, though, what you're saying is absolutely there, is that you know we can now try to construct these inclusive, cohesive identities um, with social welfare in mind, right? So, so we can kind of, you know, we learn from that and yeah. do this more kind of strategically. Um, and I think, I think that, that that is something. It's almost like taking what you have learned and found from history and using it, even though it wasn't performed altruistically, using it to, to improve social welfare outcomes. In the U.S., I think sometimes when you think of it at the city level, I think it's sometimes more obvious. Um, mm -hmm. But I sometimes think of, you know, pride in different cities, what different cities stand for, mm -hmm. and city-level projects. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do think there's a way in which, you know, you can call on that New Yorker identity for or certain Boston, or Boston, or, right? Yeah. Yes, and you see it, I think, in particular when that community comes under stress. Mm -hmm. You know, when that identity is there and it's inclusive, um, there is a way in which that power of that identity can be harnessed. So I think, you know, there are almost two questions. One is, how do you construct that identity and in an inclusive fashion? But then when you have that identity, I think sometimes we kind of underestimate its potential. Mm -hmm. We don't realize what we can what we can ask from it and so the city that I come from Delhi which I, I I don't I think most Delhiites will agree we don't really have a sense of kind of mm -hmm. it's the kind of city that people love to hate mm -hmm. but I often think you know now of the biggest problem that kind of confronts Delhi which is air pollution and in a way it's a classic um, collective action because everybody breathes the air mm -hmm. the rich and the poor so so you know how do you kind of you know how do you kind of solve this how do you how do you how do you create a sense of Deliteness yeah. that is shared? And I found it quite interesting because when I was doing archival work actually in Delhi last uh, last year when I was on leave um, from Brown, I found it quite interesting because they had begun this odd even rule, which is also in many cities across the world, including Beijing. So you can only get you can only drive your car, you know, the odd license mm -hmm. plates and then the even ones. But it's quite interesting how it was framed. There were all these radio broadcasts about, you know, Delhi, we have to do this together. Mm -hmm. uh, this is your city, um, mm -hmm. you know, and if we don't pull together, this will not happen. And even though many people had suspected that, you know, people's response would simply be, you know, buy yourself another license plate. Right. But I have a feeling that actually the consensus was that it was it was a, it was actually a moderate success. I mean, they didn't continue with it very long, mm -hmm. but but we are in this together. Yes, kind of. it was mm -hmm. very much we are in this together. I mean, we had our neighbor, um, you know, knock on my mother-in-law's door saying that, you know, can I take your car on the odd day and you can carpool with someone and, you know, and maybe you wow. can take my... I mean, it was... The people were figuring out ways to do this mm -hmm. and the metro was crowded and the line was really long mm -hmm. and I was getting impatient and then I was like, look at all these people. They're standing in line. No one is pushing. No one is shoving. And it's like, we're all in this together. Oh, yeah. That's such a great example yeah, and so of the you seeing it play out. Absolutely. And so, you know, and, the, and, you know, some amount of shaming, I think, you know, when you're constructing that identity is that we're in this together, Delhi, let's do this together. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is, we're doing this for Delhi, but this is what being a Delhiite means. You so know? Th those outliers who are not acting in the us mode 
become them <laughs> in a way. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, all groups work on sanctions. Mm-hmm. Not that I'm a huge fan of them, but I do think that there is, a, and you can have moral sanctions, but you know. But it's join us or or not. Well, right? yeah, and you know, I mean, you kind of, you, you do have to kind of construct that sense of ethical obligation yeah. and mutual commitment. And so, mm-hmm. you, I mean, these are not easy things to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not easy to construct these identities or these solidarities. But I think that, you know, they they can be very rewarding. And in a world, I think, in which we really need to think of creative solutions out of the box um, and really kind of, in a way, tap human potential. This is one... Yeah, at all levels. At all levels. This right. is one dimension that I kind of sometimes feel frustrated that policy practitioners don't realize that this is quite central to do a lot of what they want to do. I wonder if you talk about that in your teaching. Do you bring this up in class, this sort of larger notion of... Of identities. Of and identity and, and potential and sort of the imperative of... The, the hope... I don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but the this, this sort of how to harness the positive potential of some nationalism or identity. Yeah, or like today nationalism is seen as... It becomes almost conflated mm-hmm. with, you know... The, the Trumps, the Marie Le Pen's, the mm-hmm. Narendra Modi's, mm-hmm. the Xi Jinping's, you know, this kind of rise of, of nationalism mm-hmm. that is exclusive, that's xenophobic, mm-hmm. that's jingoistic. Um, so I fear that, you know, we kind of have that throwing the baby out with the bathwater problem is that, you know, as liberal elites, then we kind of, in a way, entirely secede from nationalism. We, we are losing control of our definition of our own identity by letting these other people define it in this exclusive chauvinistic fashion Mm -hmm. but my point is you know don't give up on nationalism say this is not this is not the nationalism we stand for there is an alternative nationalism but don't don't give up on nationalism don't say that this you know oh these nationalists you know i mean I i think there's been there's never been a more urgent time to be a nationalist i again when i was back in india last year there had been these, which is a part of a larger trend, you know, a Hindu nationalist government is in power in India, and they had begun these really serious, very worrying attacks um, on universities, which are obviously sometimes, um, you know, the first to be attacked because mm-hmm. they're spaces for free thought. Mm-hmm. So one of um, India's best-known um, universities where some of the most leading thinkers and academics have come from, Jawaharlal Nehru University, they came onto campus, they arrested the student union leader yeah, in Delhi, was like, you know, Delhi was on the streets. Mm -hmm. So when I went for this protest, I was like, you know, making my sign in the auto ride on the way there. And I had all these markers. And a few of our friends kind of, I think, gave me a kind of second look because I had painted a large flag of India. And I had written on it, um, who's India, question mark, are India. And, you know, it wasn't, I would say, the modal type of poster, which was much more kind of against the state, against the idea of the nation, um, much more radical posters. But this poster to me was kind of my way of saying, I don't give up on the idea of India. I don't give up on the nation. You do not have the monopoly to define this. I'm an, I'm an Indian nationalist because, you know, in a way my research shows me that it's the way that you construct these identities. It's what you imbue them with. There are so many lessons in your book for today's world. Yeah. But it seems just so incredibly relevant Yeah, today. and I mean, in a way, the book... The book began with a concern for real-world issues. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, present issues. So I really began by looking at, in like, social indicators across Indian states and realizing, you know, the same thing that you were struck by is that, you know, the quality of life that you lead is determined so critically by which state in India you're born in. And so... And that that's today... Yeah. Right. The way that I kind of got into history is more kind of tracing that back and saying, OK, there was a moment in time when that was not the case. Right. When, you know, states in India looked quite similar in terms of social welfare indicators. Yeah. And so what happened? Uh-huh. Right. Like what happened for these southern states to become these in a way much healthier, much more educated um, places as compared to North Central India. Right, and and by extension, it doesn't have to be this way. Exactly, it doesn't at all have to be this way. Mm-hmm. It was quite an unexpected route that the research took mm-hmm. because I didn't really kind of expect going into the project to say, well, you know, it really has to do with the way these linguistic identities got constructed. Mm-hmm. So it was a kind of unexpected yeah. link to make. And I think, but the thing is, once... 
once I got it, it just made so much sense. Uh-huh. And when and when you you know pose this to people in Kerala and Tamil Nadu, in a way, to me, the kind of litmus test for the argument was whether you know this would be this would be plausible would in India. With mm-hmm. Yes, mm-hmm. and I think the fact that it's the book is met with this kind of overwhelmingly positive reception in India, but also in like Kerala and Tamil Nadu, where people are like, yes, this is it. You know, like it, our regional pride is not coincidental to our levels of social welfare. This is, you know, this is what it means to be a kind of cohesive Tamil community. And so so I think that has been kind of quite rewarding. That must be so gratifying. It is, it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you never know where it's going to go. Oh, Prana, this has been so interesting and I think intensely useful for people in policy and making positions to think about. Yeah, thank I hope so. Thank you so much for no, talking to No, thank us you so today. much for this inviting me. This is great. Lots of fun. This has been Trending Globally, Politics and Policy. If you enjoyed today's conversation, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher, or download us on your favorite podcasting app. If you like us, rate us, and help others who might enjoy the show find us. For more information, go to watson.brown.edu.